So thank you for uh, acceptance for this uh, invitation. It's a great pleasure to have you here. Uh, I, I would like to thank you for um, uh, Ivor to let me know about your work. Uh, and well, you have 60 or 60 minutes or something like that for your talk, and after that, some, some questions, okay? Well, let's go. Thank you. Good stuff. Thank, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm, uh, I'm delighted to be in this, uh, in this particular virtual space. Um, so um, I'll also try to keep this relatively short. It's, um, it's work in progress, um, and it would be interesting to have some feedback. Um, but I hope I will not take more than um, maybe 30, 40 minutes. Um, the question I'm interested in is who is responsible when an autonomous weapon system or killer robot, an artificially intelligent killer robot commits a war crime? And this uh, topic has sort of been initiated by uh, an important article by Robert Sparrow from 2007. And in contrast to most philosophical um, thought experiments or considerations in general, it gets a lot of attention in the real world. Um, so I think this is a really, um, this, is a, this is a worthwhile topic to work on because it might have important um, ramifications, um, in particular as regards international law. What is an autonomous um, weapon system or a killer robot, as I always, uh, also might, um, might label it? Um, Sparrow defines it as a system which is directed by a sophisticated artificial intelligence capable of analyzing its surroundings, a system which can independently determine its target and the means to eliminate the target for complex reasons, and a system which can learn from experience so that its actions can only be partially predicted and controlled. And in the article, um, <clears throat> the central question is, as I just said, who is responsible when such a system commits a war crime? And Sparrow's response is, quite plausibly, nobody. And since just war principles require the possibility of holding combatants, people who fight um, on the battlefield, or their superiors, as morally responsible for combatants' actions, the development of autonomous weapon systems must be or so he argues, must be prohibited. In this talk, I'm quickly going to go through Sparrow's argument in some more detail, um, give two potential interpretations of it, and uh, then sort of investigate one of the two possible interpretations empirically with a um, small series of experiments. Um, finally pre present something um, which might not be directly relevant to the topic, but which is extremely surprising and interesting, and then conclude. So here's the argument. The first premise states that it is, and I quote, unethical to deploy autonomous systems involving sophisticated artificial intelligences in warfare unless someone can be held responsible for the decisions they make where these might threaten human life. And what's important to um, justify this premise is um, certain principles laid down in the Geneva Convention, which require that it be possible to hold combatants and their superiors morally responsible for their actions. Otherwise, um, it might not even make any conceptual sense um, to talk about just war. So in short, the premise is just war requires the possibility of ascribing moral responsibility, and it's a premise which I just accept as given. The second premise of um, Sparrow's argument states, and I quote, it is hard to take seriously the idea that a machine should or could be held responsible for the consequences of its actions. We can easily imagine a robot being causally responsible for some deaths. However, we typically balk at the idea that they could be morally responsible. So in a slogan, we could say um, the second premise states that robots cannot be held morally responsible. And in fact, Sparrow gives us some sort of supporting um, consideration in favor of this premise, according to which 
the impossibility of punishing the machine means that we cannot hold the machine responsible. So more explicitly, one could state the premise such that robots cannot be held morally responsible because they cannot be punished. The third premise of the argument says that neither the programmer of the artificially intelligent agent nor the commanding officer can be held responsible for its actions because the latter, because these actions are only partially predictable and controllable. And Sparrow writes, it would be analogous to holding parents responsible for the actions of their children once they have left their care um, if we would hold the programmer or commanding officer responsible for the actions of an autonomous weapon system. <clears throat> so in a nutshell, neither the programmer nor the commander can be held responsible for the actions of the autonomous weapon systems due to limited control. Sparrow concludes that autonomous weapon systems should not be used in war because they violate um, just war principles, and he also um, more severely concludes um, that their development <clears throat> should presumably be, be made illegal. <clears throat> this is why I said that this is a very important argument. It's, for instance, an argument which is um, discussed a lot by experts of the United Nations, the International Red Cross, and um, similar institutions. So there are two potential interpretations of the argument. Um, on the one hand, one might say, the argument draws on tacit substantial moral and meta-ethical assumptions. For instance, on the Kantian view, moral responsibility requires autonomy, and robots cannot be deemed autonomous in the demanding Kantian sense of giving themselves um, sophisticated rules or laws. On a second interpretation, the argument relies not on moral and meta-ethical assumptions, but on simply widely held conceptual intuitions. Sparrow writes, we balk at the idea that robots could be morally responsible, which suggests that attributing responsibility to a robot might amount to conceptual confusion or perhaps a category mistake. Now, <clears throat> I think the argument does indeed rely, rely at least in parts on um, conceptual intuitions, which can be assessed empirically. So what I'm going to address is um, a second interpretation of the argument, um, which I um, think is susceptible to um, empirical inquiry, um, whereas the first interpretation might not be. So here's the first of two experiments. Um, the goal is to explore whether Sparrow's second premise, according to which robots cannot be held morally responsible, and his third premise, according to which commanders um, and programmers cannot be responsible for autonomous robots or their actions, are as intuitively plausible as he makes them out to be. So I ran a scenario which is based on a thought experiment provided by Sparrow himself, which features a war crime committed either by a human being or by an autonomous weapon systems, a system that is an artificially intelligent robot or a killer robot, if you want. I recruited 84 US participants online, and they were assigned to one of the two conditions um, and asked multiple questions. So there's two conditions. Um, the first one um, read thus. Two neighboring countries, Tundland and Vexiton, are at war. With each other. Smith, a unit commander of the Air Force of Tundland, sends a combat aircraft to attack a metal factory of Vexitan. The aircraft carries heavy air to ground weaponry. It is steered by Captain Woods, an experienced war pilot. Woods succeeds in bombing the enemy's metal factory. Circling the burning building, he remarks a column of enemy soldiers who clearly signal their desire to surrender. They have dropped their weapons and are waving a white flag. Woods entertains the idea of watching over them, ordering backup, and taking them as prisoners. However, he concludes that the costs of the operation would be too high. Instead, he drops a bomb on the soldiers, all of whom die. <clears throat> and in the second scenario, everything is held fixed, except that um, 
the aircraft is not steered by Woods, the experience, experienced war pilot, but by MX2. You can see it um, highlighted in red. A robot with artificially intel artificial intelligence fully capable of making independent decisions. Everything else is the same. So whenever um, the former scenario, the human pilot scenario involved Woods, I replaced it by MX2. The participants then responded to the following questions. How morally wrong do you consider the action of dropping the bomb on the surrendering soldiers? And they responded on a seven point Likert scale ranging from one not wrong at all to seven extremely wrong. Thereafter, they um, responded to the question, to what extent do you consider Woods or MX2 morally responsible for the death of the surrendering soldiers? And again, re responded on a seven point Likert scale, responding from, uh, ranging from not responsible at all to completely responsible. Finally, they had to answer question three, which read, to what extent do you consider Commander Smith who deployed the pilot, whether it was a human being or a robot, morally responsible for the death of the surrendering soldiers. So um, we have, um, these aren't the results actually. Um, this is just, I mean, I imagine this is not necessary for you. Um, this is an explanation of how the chart works. So if we're on the lower end of the spectrum, we have um, an attribution of little wrongness so responsibility to the agent. And if we are on the higher end of the spectrum, we have a lot of wrongness or responsibility ascription. Here are the results for wrongness of action. You can see the darker bar um, um, refers to um, the mean ascribed wrongness of action with respect to the human pilot and the lighter bar with respect to the robot pilot. There is no significant difference. And you see there's a high level of attribution of wrongness of action. As regards the responsibility of the pilot, you can see that um, the, the human being was considered, um, considered um, significantly more responsible than the um, um, killer robot or the autonomous weapon system. Importantly though, in both cases, um, the mean attribution of responsibility was significantly above the midpoint. So in the human case, we have a relatively pronounced, yes, the human being is responsible or the human pilot is responsible for the deaths of these soldiers. And we have at least a tentative yes as regards the robot. How responsible did people um, consider the commander in the two scenarios? Well, in the uh, robot scenario, he's considered um, much more responsible for the death of the soldiers than in the um, human pilot scenario. And um, the human case, um, we do actually not have a significant difference from the midpoint, whereas in the um, robot case, we do. And then. If you average the total um, responsibility, um, if, you, if you average out the responsibility ascribed to pilot and commander, um, that is, you calculate some sort of mean responsibility um, ascribed in the particular um, scenarios, you see that um, there is a little more responsibility ascribed in the robot case than in the human case. But in both cases, it seems there is a considerable amount of responsibility that is attributed um, either to the pilot or the responsible commander, in both cases significantly above the midpoint. So it's not the case that responsibility in the robot case just um, disappears as Robert Sparrow um, fears. So our first finding is that people do seem to hold the autonomous weapon system responsible, at least to some extent. This casts doubt on Robert Sparrow's second premise, namely that robots cannot be held morally responsible or they will do so. Um, and the second finding is that the difference in ascribed responsibility between robot and human seems to be passed on to the commander who is in the robot scenario clearly held responsible. So it also seems to be the case that the premise number three is um, on shaky footing, um, it um, 
doesn't seem to be evident that the commander cannot be held responsible for the actions of the autonomous weapon systems due to the limited control. Now, I, I can imagine Robert Sparrow, like similar, this is, very, um, this is a very popular and widely defended argument. Um, I imagine that people who um, advocated would maybe say one of the two following things. Um, they could say, for instance, the autonomous weapon system and its capacities were specified in insufficient detail in these scenarios, and it is thus difficult for participants to arrive at clear intuitions. I think this is a viable concern. Or secondly, they could say the vignette fails to highlight the limited control human agents have over the autonomous weapon system, which might distort judgments regarding the commander's responsibility for the, for the robot's action. So since the, the vignette is not sufficiently clear, people tend to ascribe more responsibility to the commander in the robot, um, uh, in the robot scenario. Um, and therefore, um, premise three seems to be wrong, but it, actually, um, it is actually much more plausible than these preliminary findings make it out to be. So in order to address these concerns, I ran a second experiment. In, in this case, there was only um, a single condition. Um, it focused exclusively on the robot, because um, the kind of problems um, that I just raised perhaps are only important for the robot condition. So there was a single scenario focusing on the autonomous weapon system, which came in two parts. The first part um, gave people a detailed description of the capacities of the robot on the basis of the United States Department of De Defense report from uh, 2011. And the second part was um, the exact same thing, which you've just seen for the first, exa uh, for, for the first experiment. I recruited um, 59 US participants online who read the scenario and responded to a number of questions. So, you know, once, once you want to describe um, an autonomous weapon system in, 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 in exhaustive detail, it's perhaps important to, to um, look to sources um, that are authoritative in this regard. Um, and as philosophers or philosophically minded people, we know how complicated um, it is to define autonomy. Um, so what I did is I, um, I looked elsewhere um, to a widely cited document, namely the uh, US Department of Defense report called Unmanned Systems Integrated Roadmap 2011 to 2036, which um, says the following. To operate in complex and uncertain environments, <clears throat> the autonomous system must be able to sense and understand the environment. The perception system must be able to perceive and infer the state of the environment from limited information and be able to assess the intent of other agents in the environment. This understanding is needed to provide future autonomous systems with the flexibility and adaptability for planning and executing missions in, complex, in a complex dynamic world. So you see that the demands um, on these machines are relatively um, high. And here's the, the, the first and the new part which um, participants were presented with. So the Air Force of Tundland develops a new robot called MX-2, which is equipped with artificial intelligence. MX-2 is to be employed to fly combat aircrafts. It learns from analyzing battle situations and from its own experience in simulated and actual combat. A lot of these systems already actually exist in this, um, in this way. It is able to sense and understand its surroundings. This is taken verbatim from the report and can inter interact with the, the environment. MX2 is capable of analyzing the dynamics of a battlefield, uh, of a battle from limited information, and it is able to assess the intent of other agents in the environment. It is also capable of communicating with other human and robotic agents to share information and devise joint strategies, which is also a feature some of these um, systems already have. It can determine which target to attack and which means to employ. Since MX2 is an autonomous agent, its actions can only be partially predicted and controlled. So people read this just to get a little clearer on what kind of a system is at issue. And then they were presented with the robot um, scenario, which I read to you just um, a couple of minutes ago. 
so the two countries are at war, and MX2, this intelligent robot, um, kills a column of surrendering soldiers. There were three types of questions um, in this case. Um, the first one focused, again, on wrongness. How morally wrong do you consider the action of dropping the bomb on the surrendering soldiers? The second tried to um, give us a clearer grasp on uh, potentially necessary conditions of autonomy. So one asked, to what extent do you agree with the following claim? It is appropriate to say that MX2 analyzed and understood the outcome of its actions. And the second one, to what extent do you, do you agree with the following claim? It is appropriate to say that MX2 decided to kill the surrounding soldiers. So these are proxies for um, at least a minimal conception of autonomy where the so-called um, autonomous system takes its own decisions and is ascribed the ability to analyze and understand um, actions and outcomes. And then people were presented with uh, responsibility questions, which we are already familiar with. Um, to what extent do you consider the MX2 morally responsible for the death of the surrendering soldiers? And to what extent do you consider Commander Smith morally responsible? And finally, I tested this kind of little um, support argument um, Sparrow um, presents in favor of his um, second premise of why um, robots cannot be held um, morally responsible, which invokes punishability or the impossibility to punish a machine. So people um, were presented with a question, to what extent do you agree with the following statement? It makes sense to say that MX2 can be punished for its actions, and do you consider it possible to hold agents that can cannot be punished? morally responsible. <clears throat> Here are the results. Um, so as you can see, we only have a single column now for a, a single bar because we um, no longer um, test um, for the human pilot. We're just looking at how people understand um, the various capacities and uh, abilities of the um, autonomous weapon system. So again, you know, and consistent with the previous findings, um, people say the action was clearly wrong. Um, they are a little undecided as regards, you know, the capacity to analyze and understand um, the action and the outcome. Um, you see that there is no significant difference in the results, in the mean results from the midpoint four. On the other hand, um, they do agree that the robot really decided to kill people. They do, again, think the robot is responsible. Um, and to a similar extent, consider the commander responsible. In both cases, um, the responsibility descriptions um, significantly exceed the midpoint four. So, Contrary to Sparrow's premise two and, and premise three, a considerable degree of responsibility is ascribed to the autonomous weapon system and the commander. So it seems that the argument at least interpreted in the second um, way I proposed is um, not particularly convincing. Let's turn to the supporting argument for the second premise, why it is impossible, uh, impossible to hold an autonomous weapon system responsible, Sparrow says, because it makes no sense to punish a machine. Now, we found that autonomous weapon systems are deemed morally responsible for their actions. Um, so is there maybe a confusion? Do people also consider it punishable? Are they completely on the wrong, tr on, on the, on the wrong track? Um, it doesn't look like it. Um, so you see that punishability ratings are low, significantly below the midpoint, while um, moral responsibility ratings are significantly above the midpoint. Um, and naturally, this, this difference is also significant. Um, and here's the kind of thing I, I suggested to Eva. Um, it's sort of, you know, the one thing is I, I ask people particular things about um, uh, a scenario-driven choice, um, but I also double-check with, um, you know, um, with them whether they hold the principle um, in the abstract. Um, I ask them, is it possible to hold agents that cannot be punished morally responsible? Um, and the majority said yes. So, you know, in this case we have um, 
we have support for the kind of finding, um, or we, 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 we have consistent findings both as regards sort of the concrete scenario and the abstract principles. What does this mean? It means that contrary to Sparrow's premise too, people's experimentally revealed and their explicitly avowed beliefs suggest that they consider it possible to hold agents responsible, morally responsible, that cannot be punished. So not only uh, the second and the third premise under pressure in general, um, also the supporting reason Sparrow offers for the second one um, is not evident. Okay. <clears throat> So this might be a potentially second paper, but I'm, uh, I, I just really want to share this with, with you because I'm, um, I was extremely surprised by, um, by what's coming next. So fiddling around with the data, um, I found that age seems to have a strong impact on whether or not the autonomous weapon system is deemed morally responsible. I created two partitions, and it doesn't really matter so much. I've since replicated the, these findings with a larger sample size, and you, you know how exactly you can. Uh, you define the young cohort and the old cohort doesn't matter so much. Um, the, the results are pretty consistent. Um, what I'm going to present here is um, I split the data in two. There's young people whose mean age is um, a third of a standard deviation younger than the um, average age. So they're younger than 35 years. And I define an old co cohort whose mean age is a third of a standard deviation um, older than the mean age. Um, which is 41 years or older. And then I look at the responses again. So we have, as you can see, the darker bar, which um, are the, response, the, the, the mean um, responses of the young cohort, and the lighter bar, which are the mean responses of the old cohort. Um, and unsurprisingly, in terms of um, wrongness of action, we do not find a significant difference. We also do not find a significant difference with respect to um, the robot's ability to um, analyze and understand the situation. There's no significant difference with respect to its ability to decide to kill the soldiers. Um, so it seems that the robot or its capacities um, relevant for autonomy are conceived in very similar terms. But here comes the exciting thing. Um, Namely that we do have a um, significant difference in the ascription of moral responsibility to the autonomous weapon system. You can see that um, the young folks um, uh, average is some um, close to six, so they give a, quite a decisive yes to the question, is the robot responsible for the death of the soldiers? Whereas the older people, um, which is the light bar, they're sort of sitting on the fence. There's no significant difference between the mean response and the uh, midpoint. This is what I just said. Um, <clears throat> and naturally, you know, if you're more unwilling to hold the robot responsible, you're, as we saw before, you're more likely to shift the responsibility onto um, another person, for instance, the commander, potentially also the programmer um, for whom I did not control in these, in, in these experiments. Um, so I find this really interesting. Summarizing, so age has no impact on judgments of wrongness of the action or the robot's capacities. And one could infer that the robot is perceived in relatively similar ways. Um, however, and importantly, younger people ascribe moral responsibility to the robot, whereas older people do not. This raises some questions, for instance, is the concept of moral responsibility age-sensitive? Um, does it maybe, does it, does it constitute perhaps a category mistake for older people to say that robots could be, even in principle, morally responsible, whereas um, the domain of potentially morally responsible things um, for younger people does include um, autonomous weapon systems or autonomous systems in general. Um, this would be interesting to um, explore in more detail. Um, or is it perhaps the concept of autonomous weapon systems, which um, itself is age sensitive? We at least have prima facie um, arguments against it, because as you saw, this is of course not exhaustive, but um, as you saw, the capacities um, of analysis and decision-making of the robot 
are judged in the same way by young and old. So this this might be um, so I find this extremely extremely fascinating, and this might be a wholly um, different paper um, because I'm principally concerned with Sparrow's argument, um, but um, but there might be something interesting um, in terms of um, perhaps uh, social psychological implications um, in this kind of um, work. Let's conclude. So I've been I've been attacking two premises, not attacking really, because after all, I think um, Sparrow's arguments uh, argument on philosophical grounds is true. Um, but I've taken issue with premise two, where Sparrow writes that we balk at the idea that robots could be morally responsible because robots cannot be punished. But we, and in particular younger people, it seems, do not balk at the idea, and we seem to view moral responsibility as conceptually independent of punishability. As regards premise three, which states that the commander or the programmer, which I did not test for, cannot be held responsible for the robot's action since it, it is only partially controlled, we found that lay people find it appropriate to hold the commander morally responsible for the robot's action and that the mean responsibility ascribed across robot and commander um, is um, relatively stable across the two types of scenarios, the human scenario and the robot scenario, which we um, tested for. So what does this mean for the argument? Um, it means that with suitable moral and meta-ethical premises, for instance, a strong Kantian concept of autonomy, Sparrow's argument might still be innocuous. Given the findings, however, the force of the argument is much more limited and its truth therefore much more elusive than originally supposed. We need to sign up to, um, for, for a certain, for instance, a Kantian concept of autonomy, which many people presumably do not. Um, and um, it would have been a much more, convincing uh, much more convincing argument if all of us actually just think um, it's a brutal or brute or simple category mistake to ascribe moral responsibility to um, machines. So this is it. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you, Marcos. Uh, well, we have a pl plenty of time to, to discuss, and it, this is great. And well, I think your paper is a perfect example of the benefits of um, experimental uh, philosophy for uh, traditional philosophical argument, OK? Uh, well, and, and thank you for that. But uh, I have two questions, uh, at least. Uh, the first one, uh, what you think could be the analogies or these analogies between autonomous weapons cases and self-driving cars like Uber that uh, killed a, a woman uh, in Arizona uh, four days ago? Uh, what, what do you think could be this? Uh, the analogies for these cases, for the self-driving cases. See, the deal is this. I mean, um, so I think the, the analogies are limited um, for the following reasons. Um, we know that we know that robots, um, artificially intelligent robots or machines, um, perform much better than human beings. For instance, on the battlefield, the great thing about um, an autonomous weapon system is that it doesn't get angry that it um, doesn't rape people, that it doesn't kill civilians um, out of spite. Um, and um, therefore there might be, um, you know, there might be good reasons, not, not only the autonomous um, uh, sort of in the self-driving car case, but also in the, on the battlefield to have these kinds of robots. The big difference between the two types, uh, types of cases is that, um, you know, uh, autonomous weapon systems are designed to kill. Um, so, um, yeah. whereas, um, whereas um, self-driving cars and, and, are designed to um, in the transport, as it, it transport as, as, as safely as possible. Yeah, um, it's only in accidental And I think, time. therefore, for, uh, sorry, I didn't hear you. For, for self-driving cars, killing people is an accident, not, a, not the purpose uh, of... Uh, 
That, that's exactly what I said. So um, autonomous weapon systems are designed to kill, okay, whereas um, self-driving cars are not. Um, so that makes them very different kinds of applications. Um, so I think um, these kinds of moral considerations, you know, the very possibility of moral responsibility um, is extremely important for combatants whose, whose principal function is to kill human beings. Whereas if the principal function of, um, you know, a self-driving car is just to get us safely across, um, across town, um, then these kinds of moral considerations do not arise um, in the same form. Um, so it's always a matter of accidents, but there's like, you know, there's a lot of accidents that, ha that happens, like people fall down staircases and still staircases um, are very useful, um, but they're not designed to kill us. Um, so a lot of what I've just said, I think, only, do, um, only applies to systems um, whose single and principal purpose is to kill human beings. Okay. Well, Pascal uh, uh, did send us a, a, a very uh, big question. I, I recommend you to, to read it. Okay, good. I'll um, I read it out and I'll... Um, no, I'll if, if, if you need... If so you, you might give me some, or, some, some time. I'm, 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 I'm trying to understand it as I, as I read it, but... Uh, yeah. Let's see. Um, Here's Pascal's question. How can we be sure that people in the human agent condition answer the same thing as, partic as participants in the autonomous weapon system condition when they gave their moral responsibility rating? It seems to me quite plausible that you ascribe real moral responsibility to the agent, that is the human agent, but to ascribe a metaphorical moral responsibility to the autonomous weapon system. And the same varies apply to all action and human-related concepts um, on experiment two, like perceiving, acting, deciding, and so forth. Um, this is a this is a very um, very compelling uh, point. Let's have a look. Um, so, uh, <laughs> unfortunately, I'm. <laughs> This, these are the only, um, I've repl replicated this data and sort of slightly varied the scenarios and so forth. It's relatively stable, but, um, uh, you know, I can't, um, I can't answer these worries, which I think are very justified um, conclusively. Um, is there anything, you know, in the, um, in the data which we can um, sort of use to sort of, at least formulate hypotheses in response to Pascal's question, I would say, well, see, in principle, the, like the responses are more or less on the right track. Now, um, we do have, let's see, we do have a, significant, a significantly lower ascription of moral responsibility to the robot, this is the second set of bars, than to the human being. So they do seem to register a difference. Now, if they just change the meaning of moral responsibility, presumably the two bars would be the same. And the same holds for the responsibility of the commander, where you know the responses quite clearly indicate that in the human case, people go, no, it's the pilot that was responsible. So um, already, if he's responsible, it can't be the commander, because it's the, the, the pilot who, who decided. Um, uh, whereas in the robot case, um, people shift um, a large amount of blame onto the commander. So in principle, I think this would suggest, at least preliminarily, that people understand the, um, the expression moral responsibility in similar ways um, across the two scenarios. On the other hand, um, I do think since, since the whole thing just hangs on uh, on how moral responsibility is understood, it might be extremely helpful um, if, for instance, I just ran a number of scenarios with, you know, stupid machines which are not artificially intelligent, um, maybe children, you know, where we might have difficulties in ascribing moral responsibility, um, very reflected human beings where it might be very um, or reflective agents um, where it might be really easy to describe it and therefore sort of sensitivize um, people to 
um, to the relevant concept of moral responsibility. So it might be a matter of like um, priming and also on the basis of like other scenarios, um, excluding certain people who might understand moral responsibility in a metaphorical way. I'm not really sure what metaphorical means here. Um, I, I think sort of the most reasonable hypothesis in the vicinity is that people just say, um, ah, responsibility that, I mean, the robot caused it, okay? So it's, it's, it's sort of causal responsibility. One could also perhaps say, um, one could give people a chance to ascribe causal responsibility and then ask for moral responsibility so that they, that they are aware of an explicit difference between the two types of concepts. Um, so, so I think this um, this is a very good um, good um, very. So Pascal um, continues. She she writes yes, causal responsibility plus, and the outcome was bad. Um, yes, um, yes, 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 yes. Um, good. Okay, good. I agree. Shall I move on to the next? Um, yeah, yeah, of to course. The next question. Of yeah. course. Take your time to read. Thanks, Pascal. This, about... this is a really. Okay, I'll, I'll read it. Um, in any case, th thanks, Pascal. This is a really helpful um, question. Vilius writes um, just a little idea for follow up. In the history of warfare, there were other means of warfare that are agent like and only partially controlled and predicted. Say, deploying war elephants or dropping bags of snakes by a catapult. I wonder if these agents would be perceived differently than robots in terms of their responsibility and responsibility of people who unleash them on the enemy. Perhaps the killer bots would not be too different from these old weapons. Um, so this is, um, this is really interesting. Um, so I haven't... I've never heard of um, snakes being catapulted into the um, enemy's camp, um, but in any case, this is um, this is good. So, um, so one could think about a whole range um, of agents. Um, animals would be at the lower end. Um, they they are a bit like mines, no? Or like so, we know that hungry snakes bite people who are around them. Um, we know that if people s sort of step on mines, they explode. Um, so here, I would imagine that at least a reasonable um, respondent would shift most of the blame onto the um, commander or the, the, the next best human being in the, uh, in the chain. Something in between might be, you know, child soldiers, um, because children are autonomous, are considered autonomous to a certain extent, but at the same time, they're frequently not considered um, fully formed moral agent. So here we, we might also have um, uh, we might also register a lower description of moral responsibility than to a fully formed adult moral agent like uh, like the experienced war pilot, um, and um, it might thus be good to um, to employ a whole spectrum of um, agents that are autonomous to different degrees. And I think the kinds of things that are at stake here, or trained hounds, um, see these. Are, I mean, in principle, we don't consider animals um, as morally responsible. Um, so I think these cases, you know, where you go with, um, but they're unpredictable, so, so they are interesting um, in that regard because it might be difficult to shift on the responsibility onto the next human being. Um, uh, I think these things are, these cases are probably similar to just employing weapons which are to a certain extent automatic but not autonomous. You know? um, or there at least something in between the two, um, but these are these are very good suggestions, and I'll um, I maybe run five or six scenarios with um, agents that have a different degree of autonomy. Um, so thank you very much. This is um, this is not only um, a good suggestion, but also very interesting um, to hear that um, snakes have been catapulted um, into enemy camps. So maybe I just continue. So Pascal Pascal yeah. writes. Um, I was just thinking about the wording of the abstract question about punishability and moral responsibility. You asked whether it was possible to hold someone responsible who cannot be punished. You might want to specify in what sense it cannot be punished. Maybe people just think of an agent who disappeared after her crime, who has some immunity, or who is already in prison. But this is different from being unpunishable in general, like the autonomous weapon system. I completely agree. And, um, 
uh, I think the question should read some like you know how the question should precisely read is always difficult so that people understand it. But um, philosophically speaking, it should be re be read. Uh, it should read um, thus: um, Is it possible to hold an age and morally responsible if, in principle, it cannot be punished? Um, so this is another um, very very good point from Pascal. Um, I agree. Well. Um I have a, a second question, Marcos. Is well, mm -hmm. so by by your criteria, I'm I am a old man now. Well, I, I have more than forty-one. Okay. See, and, I am myself <laughs> actually. Um, and 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 considering well, your not, no. your surprising data, uh, I think would would be possible to predict. Uh, changes in the concept or uh, of moral responsibility in in that uh, at, at least in that technological cases uh, across ages in the future. Yeah? Uh, I think we'll be we will we see this concept changing uh, uh, in the future. Well, uh, what what could be an, an explanation for that changing? for that changes in the future? This is, this is a really good question. Um, so, um, so the two hypotheses I have, um, and this is not very, you know, it's not very well thought through yet. Um, I, I think, um, so, so we, have, we have two root hypotheses now. Um, and then we come to your particular point. Um, is the concept of moral responsibility age sensitive, or it might be the concept of an autonomous um, weapon system, or you know, an autonomous robot? Um, so first of all, that has to be uh, determined whether young people might just have a different um, concept of moral responsibility, or whether they have a different concept of um, autonomous systems. Um, I would, even though the data suggests perhaps the former, I would imagine that the latter makes more sense. Um, and now to respond to, to your question, so say young people have a different conception of autonomous systems, then we have further follow-up hypotheses. Now the one could be, okay, there's something like inherent in age um, that um, sort of um, just as people get more sort of conservative, the older they are, um, maybe um, they are less and less willing to um, <laughs> accept non um, non 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 human um, agents as sufficiently autonomous for moral responsibility or something like that. This is, of course, I, I find this deeply implausible. So, what I mean, what's driving the thing is the following. I imagine this is, but this is an empirical hypothesis. I have absolutely nothing to prove it. Um, see, like I mean, the people who are under thirty-one, they um, they were taking like. The, one of the, the, their first and, uh, and best friends were Tamagotchis, and all these like little eggs, these Japanese um, games where they um, rear like a chicken out of an egg. Um, and, um, and so they, they, and my sister like routinely cried over the Tamagotchi um, dying or something, you know, even though these were extremely primitive, of course, not even autonomous, um, far from autonomous um, uh, machine agents. Yeah? Um, but um, it always caused the biggest uproar um, every other evening when the damn thing starved okay um so they're used to treating machines as um as agents um and the way to test that might so you know you could do a longitudinal study for instance to rule out the age hypothesis or you could see how you, you could start it now and see in 40 years you know people are much more willing um again even old people um to ascribe um uh, autonomy or, or you know similar maybe free will the, the ability to um make this decisions and uh and therefore more responsibility to machines or else you can just look across cultures um and could maybe you know you could take a very technically advanced country um where all the children um routinely played with tamagotchis and um and, and similar similar things and now you know everyone has sort of autonomous cleaning robots and whatnot um and and, and uh and speech uh help uh, agents or whatever these things are called. Okay, so they have a lot of access to like complicated machinery, um, and there you have, um, you know, um, one concept of what a machine is, um, which is very um, 
conceived very similar to a human agent. And then you take a much less technically advanced country um, and source um, similar responses, and you will presumably find, this would be my hypothesis, um, that due to the lack of um, interaction with um, sophisticated machine agents, people do not see them as agents in a substantial sense at all. Um, so that would be the next step for this, you know, little bracket um, called the uh, surprising finding. That this this would really require, um, I think, um, <clears throat> sophisticated cross-cultural research um, from which we could um, infer a lot. Okay, thank thank you, thank you, Marcus. Well, uh, I think we did a, a lot of uh, good work today for today. And I, I would like to, to invite you and Pascal and Vilius as well to, to be here tomorrow, okay, for the next uh, uh, step in your workshop. Thank you, thank you very much, Marcus. Uh, have a good rest for today, okay? Bye bye. Thank you very much. Um, have a lovely afternoon. <clears throat>